Hi everyone, uh, my name is Paul Schreiber. I'm the lead developer for 538 and the Undefeated at ESPN. I'm going to talk to you this evening about security keys and U2F. First, I will explain what two-factor authentication is. Second, I'll talk about some of the problems and limitations of some methods of two-factor authentication. And then talk about some bonus features you can do once you've got a security key. So two-factor authentication refers to using more than one piece of information to authenticate or access a system. And those factors are something you know, which is like a password or a PIN. There's something you are, which is typically a biometric, like a thumbprint or a retina scan, and something you have, something that's physical, like a key or a credit card or a telephone. To access most systems today using two-factor authentication, there are four ways this can happen. The first way is the old-fashioned way. You get a text message on your phone. You can also receive the codes via a push notification. And you can use an authenticator app like Google Authenticator to get codes. And then lastly, you can use a physical device, a security key, that will authenticate you without needing to type in a code. This is the Google Authenticator app. It's one of the most common ones in use. Despite the name Google Authenticator, it's not restricted to using it with Google. You can use it for WordPress, and you can use it for Dropbox and Twitter and all kinds of other sites out there. If you have a Mac, Apple will start sending, can send you these sorts of notifications. It can request things, allow or deny, and will also give you codes that you can type in. And of course, this is the typical text message and SMS-based authentication code. We'll send it to you, you'll type it in. The problem here is that because you have to type in a code, you can still be fish. And we've known for a long time that SMS is a bad method for delivering codes. And this has been covered pretty extensively in the press. And we've been talking about it for years, and people are still doing it. And there's a U.S. government agency called NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and they issue recommendations in all kinds of things. And you think of them as weights and measures, like, am I really getting a gallon of gas when I go to the gas station and pay for this? And when I put a pound of food on the scale, a scale of the Whole Foods, is it a pound of food? But they also regulate a lot of technology things. And they issue these really interesting sounding bulletins, like NIST Special Publication 800-63B, the Digital Identity Guidelines. And if you look in there, you find this, and it says, user use of the PSTN for out-of-band verification is restricted. And it says, verifiers should consider risk indicators. So what does this mean? The PSTN, that means the public switch telephone network. That means phones. What they're saying here in a lot of bureaucratic language is don't send codes over phones. This is bad. So how do you solve this problem? We well, solve this problem with security keys. This solves two parts of the problem. One is that your phone won't be, can't be hijacked or social engineered. A typical way this happens is someone calls up Verizon or AT&T and says, hi, this is Brad, I've lost my phone, I got a new SIM card, can you activate it? And they do that, and then you break into Brad's bank account and he takes money in. So don't do that, that would be sad. Um, the other thing that can happen is even if you aren't using SMS-based authentication, you can still be tricked by a clever attacker to type your six-digit code from your authenticator app or from your push notification into their website, and then they'll type it into the real website, and then they'll get into your account. With the security key, that can't happen because there's no code to type in, and the key is tied to the actual website by the browser. Keys work in one of three ways. They can be plugged into a USB port, they can use Bluetooth, and they can use NFC, near-field communication. NFC, you probably used it when you use Apple Pay or Android Pay to tap and remove a credit card. You can also use this with your security key. These are examples of two security keys from Ubico. On the left is the basic model, uh, which fits in a standard port or a USB-A port. On the right fits, is the model that fits into a USB-C port. They also make much smaller versions that you can leave in your port Again, we have the USB-A version and the USB-C version. What models here are intended to be kept on a keychain or somewhere else, and you can put them in the computer as needed. And here we have two additional models 
The one uh, on the right is also from Ubico, and it has a little symbol on there, a little wireless symbol, which indicates that it has NFC capability. And the one on the left is from Fikian, and they support Bluetooth and NFC and USB all on the same device. And this is the device you're going to need if you have an iPhone or, or iPad, because they support NFC only for payment and not for authentication. The good news, uh, if you have a G Suite account, is that they will, Ubico will give you half off the basic model. So I dropped the price from $18 to $9, which is a really good way to get started to provide it to a large number of people in your organization. Uh, security keys will work with all the major operating systems available today. They work with Mac OS, they work on iOS, they work on Linux, they work on Windows, they work on Android. Depending on what device and what system you have, you will want to pick a different type of security key. So if you have a desktop running Mac OS or Linux or Windows, you can get a USB security key. If you have an iOS device, you need something that supports Bluetooth. And depending on your Android, you might be able to use something that supports NFC. Now, if you get an iOS device and you get one of these Bluetooth keys, you need to download an app from Google called Google Smart Lock. And that will be able to read the signal coming from the Bluetooth security key and authenticate you. Now, what about browsers? Well, this is a little bit of a different story here. The good news is, if you're using Chrome, this works out of the box. You don't have to do anything. You can start using a security key today. Now, if you have Safari or Firefox, it sort of works. And I'll explain what sort of works means in a minute. And if you have Edge, it just doesn't work at all right now. Now, in Firefox, this is off by default, but available. So if you go into a boat, clone config, and you search for web off, you can see there are a couple of attributes you can turn on. There's a U2F and a web off end, and you can enable them. Now, this still won't work with Google because they are checking for Chrome specifically and not just whether this thing works. Same with Safari. Um, there is a Safari extension you can download. You turn this on, and you have U2F available for a lot of places, but not for Google. Okay, so you, you say, this, Paul, this sounds great. I want, I have a security key right now. What can I actually do with it? Well, there are four major sites that we use every day that already support security keys. The first is Google. So if you use Gmail or if your company uses G Suite, that works. You can use the same security key for all of your Google accounts. So you don't have to buy it, carry around four keys if you have four Google accounts. You can. This works with Dropbox. This works with Facebook and it works with GitHub. Now, the good news about the browser situation is there's an emerging standard from the World Wide Web Consortium, that's the W3C, called WebAuthN. And this is an API that's gonna enable the creation and use of strong, attested, scoped, public key-based credentials by web applications. That means you can build this into your web applications soon, and this will be supported by everyone, not just Chrome. And this is what it looks like this is the GitHub sign-in screen. After I enter my username and password, I'm prompted to insert my security key and tap the button on it. Similarly, when you sign into Google, you can see I'm contributing to Gmail, that's my password, and this animates and it shows you how to put the security key into your computer. This website, dongleauth.info, has a pretty comprehensive list of sites and tools that support U2F authentication. One thing you can do if you're a Google user using Gmail and not using G Suite, this is your personal account, is Google has something called the Advanced Protection Program. And so if you are a high risk user, maybe you're a journalist reporting on corruption, maybe you are a victim of stalking, maybe you're a celebrity, um, maybe you are reporting on the government, right? You can enable this. And what this says is you can only use security keys as your two factor method, you can't use codes that you type in, you definitely can't use SMS. You have to have two of them, because if they don't want you to be locked out, if you lose your first security keys, you have to enable both. And you must use Google Apps. So if you are using the Mail app or the Calendar app on your Mac, you can't use them anymore. You would have to use Google Gmail and the Google Calendar app to do this. They make it very hard for people to break in, and there's an additional step to recover or to get into a locked account. So you there's a, a delay, and so this is a good choice 
for people in these types of situations, but because of the restrictions, it's not the right choice for everybody. All right, what about WordPress? Can I use this with WordPress? Well, yes, there's two ways to do this. One is there is a two-factor authentication plugin, which supports a whole bunch of methods. It supports SMS, it supports Google Authenticator, and it supports user app. Second is you can say, I'm gonna delegate my authentication to Google, and I'm going to use the Google Apps Login plugin, and I'll let Google handle that for me, and they can deal with managing all of the security keys and confirming that everyone is who they say they are. All right, bonus points. So, I've got a security key, and I'm using it to log into these websites. What else can I do with it? Well, depending on the model of key you have, you can do a bunch of other things. Even the most basic model, the, the U2F key only, will let you restrict access to your password manager. So instead of using a master password to get into your password manager, you can use your security key. You can also use some of the security keys uh, as an authenticator for SSH. So if you're remotely logging into a system instead of typing in a password, or instead of using passwordless key-based authentication, you can use this. And then you can also use these keys to, as a method to log into your own machine. So for the clients that you would remove from the machine when you walk away, if someone else were to walk up to it, they couldn't log in without your security key. So I hope you uh, will go home and pick up a security key for yourself and for your friends and family. And the good news is Chris has graciously donated two security keys that you're going to give away today um, at the end of the uh, Q&A session. All right, so before we do that, does anyone have any questions for me? John? If you delegate your login to Google Apps Login, mm -hmm. you make sure that only people using security keys are able to log in, or will any two-factor that Google supports? Do you know what I mean? Can you say only the people who are using UTF can do? I haven't looked at the plugin. I don't think that you can say to Google, like Google sends that information over you, they just send their authenticator that they're not. Um, if it's your own domain, right, so if you have like, you know, uh, 10up.com and you can turn on require security keys for 10up.com in the Google Admin Console, and then you only let users with 10up.com addresses in, then you're okay. But if you let rent people in with assorted personal email addresses, you don't have that sort of control. Yes, hi. So the question is, when you have a security key, can you use it on multiple properties? Yes, you can use the same security key for not only for multiple properties, but for multiple accounts within the same property. So if you have a gmail.com account and you know a, a paulsharper.com account and a you know, penout.com account and whatever, you can use the same key for all of them. And you can also use the same key with Dropbox um, and with Facebook and so on. So if, if the key is stolen, what can you do? So you if, assume you can still log in because you have a backup key or another method of getting in. You go into Google and it'll show you the list of keys that you have, and you put an X beside one and you delete it, just the same way when you change your phone number and you tell Google, this is my new phone number, you say, I don't have this key anymore. Well, so if you've lost all of your keys and you have, you, you have no other backup authentication method, you'll have to contact support. But you might have printed out some backup codes on a piece of paper and kept them you know, somewhere safe. Uh, or you might have, you know, and, uh, It'll still be allowing you know TOTP the Google Authenticator code, um, but it's just like if you lose your if you lose your phone to eat by a bear in the woods, you know you're gonna have to find a new way, like go to the phone company and get a new one, uh, and make sure that phone number is still valid, or contact the company like Google or Facebook and say I need to recover my account. Hi, I'm terrified. <laughs> what are you What are you terrified of? Just Someone hacking me. I hope I never get targeted. Huh. Yeah, so, then, so this, he says that uh, I hope I never get targeted, and this is sort of a joke, but there's a serious point here, which is for most people, having non-phone-based SMS authentication is a pretty good level of protection, right? Because if, you know, they, they're not gonna steal your phone, they would have to, if they're not gonna steal your phone number, they would have to find you and steal your phone, right? And get into your phone, and then get the codes out of your authenticator app. And that's an attack that's hard to do at scale. Like, and you can't do it from a computer in Estonia. I have to come find you and hit you over the head and steal your phone, right? Um, 
Right, which is... It, it don't get any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't hit anyone with that. He's very nice. We don't want nobody... nobody you know. But so that's one level of attack, right? But if your threat model is I'm being targeted because I'm working on a presidential campaign, or I'm being targeted because I'm reporting on corruption uh, in a developing country, then you need to get away from entering codes because that's not good enough for you. Hi. It's an unfair question, but in, in the real world, are you, do you have you found that people will, uh, you had even said it before, leave their security fobs in their machines and then doesn't that kind of... So the question is, if you leave your security key in the machine, is that bad? Um, the answer is not really. Uh, so Google employees have had these for, uh, for years and they leave them in their, mach their machine because it's a different type of threat model. It, your biggest concern is sort of a remote attack most of the time. Is somebody on the internet going to go do something bad, right? If the somebody is targeting you and they break into your trunk and steal your laptop and they've got your security key, then yes, that is a problem, right? But for most people, the, you're, that's not the thing you're trying to protect against. Can I share what our newsroom does? So I haven't seen any post-it notes with buying credentials on anyone's desk, which is a good sign. Um, we use Google Apps for documents, and we require everyone to have two-factor authentication. We don't mandate a particular form of it. Most people um, ha are using the Authenticator app because I set them up on their first week and show them how to do use it. Um, for WordPress, uh, we require everyone's account have two-factor turned on. Uh, there's some other third-party services that have varying degrees of authentication, you know, restrictions. Um, so Chartbeat lets you do it. Uh, I don't think Adobe Analytics does. So that just uses protect by passwords and so on. So for, for these third-party services, it's sort of hit and miss depending on what they're up to. Um, and we have given security keys to people with administrator-level access to our Google Apps. So those folks have it. We'd love to give it to everybody, but I haven't convinced folks to do 